Okay. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar this evening, uh, Reimagining Long Island Lawns Eco-Friendly Practices. And just so you all know, this meeting will be recorded so that if you miss it or miss part of it, you can tune in and listen in later on. Uh, so my name is Sarah Schaefer-Brown. I will be facilitating this meeting along with my colleague, Elizabeth Hornstein. Uh, we work with New York Sea Grant as the Long Island Sound Study Sustainable and Resilient Communities Extension Professionals for Nassau County and Suffolk County. And we're working with communities in the Long Island Sound watershed to advance sustainability and resiliency. And we have counterparts in Westchester County and Connecticut who are also doing the same locally. And our positions support the larger efforts of the Long Island Sound Study, which is a national estuary program created by the United States um, Environmental Protection Agency and is a partnership to protect and restore the Long Island Sound and its watershed. Um, and we also work under New York Sea Grant, which is a joint program of Cornell University, the State University of New York, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, that provides resources and support to protect the state's marine and Great Lakes resources. So me and my colleagues um, and partners on this call are so excited to um, be with so many of you uh, who are interested in learning more about sustainable landscaping and how to make your yard eco-friendly to protect and improve Long Island waters. Uh, we're lucky on Long Island to be surrounded by estuaries. Uh, estuaries are where saltwater and freshwater mix, and they provide really important habitats for wildlife and marine life. Um, so we have the Long Island Sound to the north, uh, the harbors and estuaries around New York City, the Peconic Estuary on the east end, and then the western bays, the Great South Bay, and um, the eastern bays to the south of Long Island. Um, and all these estuaries have organizations that are focused on protecting and preserving the um, resources in those embayments. And, um, you know, there are, all, there are a lot of things that we all can do as well um, on our own to protect these local waters. So the focus of tonight's webinar is to provide information on steps that homeowners can take in their own yards to protect Long Island waters. And these include uh, smart fertilizer practices, water conservation, and native plantings. And so we've heard from communities across Long Island Sound that people are concerned about local water quality, both you know, bays and harbors and drinking water, and people want to make the right decision on their property. And so it's our goal tonight to give you all a chance to learn more at this webinar and um, have an opportunity to ask questions from our experts that we are featuring this evening. And so I want to thank everyone who um, helped organize this webinar, the panelists, um, the panelists, New York State DEC, New York Sea Grant, Long Island Sound Study, um, and the Long Island Regional Planning Council. Um, so we have a great meeting agenda planned. We have, um, first off, Jimena perez Viscasias, who is the Long Island Sound Study Outreach Coordinator with New York Sea Grants. And she'll start us off with an overview of watersheds and the connection between land and our local waters. And then we'll have Sarah Healy, who is the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan or LINAP Regional Coordinator. And she'll be speaking about some of the LINAP initiatives and smart fertilizer practices. Following that, we'll have presentations from two members of the Long Island Com Commission for Aquifer Protection, LICAP. We'll have Paul Granger, who's the superintendent of the Hicksville Water District, and Michael White, who is the Suffolk County Legislator Presiding Officer. And Paul and Michael will be providing an overview of water conservation efforts in NASA and Suffolk. And then we'll wrap up our presentation session with some great um, presentations from Roxanne Zimmer, who is a community recorder culture specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. And she'll focus on native plants. And then we also have a presentation from Raju Rahan, who is the uh, board president of Rewild Long Island, who will be talking about sustainable landscaping in action. And there'll be question and answer after all of these presentations. So just hold tight uh, for the end. Um, can you go to the next slide? Thanks. So just some meeting rules um, we wanna cover so we can make sure we stay on time tonight. So please keep your phones um, and Zoom audio and your cameras off. Um, the session will be recorded again, and we'll email that out to all of the registrants along with 
the presentation slides and also a resource packet that will have more information for you all to look through um, after the webinar concludes. And we will be uh, collecting questions through the Q&A function on your bottom sidebar and uh, your bottom bar in Zoom. So if you have questions, please put them in there whenever they come to mind. And Elizabeth and I will be going through those and uh, posing them to the panelists at the end of all the presentations. And uh, we just want to remind you all that the focus of tonight's webinar is on, is on sustainable landscaping and how homeowners can protect our local waters on Long Island. And so we've asked the panelists to focus their presentations on that topic. And, you know, though we do recognize there are other really important issues that some of you may want to raise for, for questions and comments that are not relevant to the uh, webinar focus, we're going to try to direct you to, you know, a staff person or contact that might be able to directly address some of your questions um, in a little more detail. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for your attention. And so we we plan to conclude you know, promptly at 7.30 and uh, we really look forward to providing this material to all of you. So uh, without further ado, I am going to introduce Jimena, uh, our first speaker. So take it away, Jimena. Thank you, Sarah, and good evening, everybody. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Jimena Perez Vizcasillas. I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Long Island Sound Study Estuary Program. And um, while this webinar is going to mainly focus on, um, you know, behaviors and um, actions that one can take in our lawns and, and resources, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to talk about why we're doing this. So what are the environmental basics behind uh, why we should care about this? So I'm going to start with a quick poll, and I don't actually have a poll, but I invite you to um, let me know in the chat whether, where, where do you live, like what town, and whether you think you live in a watershed. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to answer, and if you don't feel comfy uh, mentioning the town, just say yes or no. Do you think you live in a watershed? I'm seeing Atlantic Beach. Merrick, yes. Port Washington, yes. Yes in Watershed. Islip, yes, yes. Lots of yeses. I don't know, but I would think so. Yes, yes. Lots of yeses. Great. Great. Yes. Okay. RBC, I don't think so. Yes, yes. All right. So, um, Okay, so thank you so much. And yes, you're correct, Catherine. Everyone does. This is a, it's kind of a trick question. I've deceived you and I am sorry, but uh, <laughs> I do like to um, ask this question to get an idea of whether people uh, understand what a watershed is and whether they live on one. But yes, indeed, everyone lives on a watershed. So what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land that drains into a particular body of water, whether that uh, body of water is a river or an estuary, a lake, a sea, etc. Basically, it is the land surrounding um, a body of water, and it can be close or it doesn't have to be, um, where whenever it rains, whenever it snows, and that water uh, either flows over the land or goes, you know, seeps through the soil and gets into the groundwater, eventually it makes it to that body of water. So, whoops, hang on, there we go. So everyone does live in a watershed, and um, I found this map of the state of New York, which I think is a really interesting one, because as you can see, it's divided in the major, uh, some of the major watersheds in New York State. And basically, no matter, you know, as you can see, no matter how far inland you are, everyone is in a watershed, meaning that uh, they are affecting a one body of water, whether it's the Hudson River, the Black River, Lake Erie, or uh, in our case, the Atlantic Ocean or the Peconic or Long Island Sound. So I couldn't find um, a, a cool map like that that really divides Long Island uh, that way. Um, but just know that if you're nearer to the South Shore, you might be in the, you know, in the watershed for the Great South Bay, and you're somewhere uh, in the East End, in the North or South Fork, you could be in the Peconic Estuary watershed. Or if you're 
closer to the North Shore of Long Island or even in Queens, um, Bronx areas of Westchester, you might be in the Long Island Sound watershed. And again, what this means is that whatever you do on land affects the water, you know, that body of water. Um, so even if you're not right by the coast, uh, there are ways in which you're probably influencing water around you. And what this also means is that whatever falls on the ground, in my case, ends up in the sound, but depending on where you live, it might influence the Great South Bay, it might influence the Peconic, you name it. Um, this, of course, can have influences uh, in our water quality, right? Uh, if, you know, if there's debris, if there's trash, once it rains, goes down uh, the, the storm drains. So there are obviously um, ramifications to this that are uh, negative. But the good news is that the fact that we all live in a watershed also means that there are steps that we can take on land right at home in our yards to help improve uh, water quality and keep it clean. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. So before we do that, I do wanna talk a little bit about nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen pollution is one of the um, main challenges that a lot of our water bodies here on Long Island face. Um, and you might've heard a bit uh, about it. So what is nitrogen, first of all? So you might remember nitrogen from your you know, third grade uh, chemistry class. Nitrogen itself is a friend, not a foe. It's a, it's a naturally occurring nutrient. In fact, it makes, makes up 78% of our atmosphere. It's um, a, a nutrient that plants need to grow. In fact, that's part of why um, it's found in so many fertilizers, and we're, we'll, we'll talk more about that soon. Um, and it's even a, a building block of our own DNA. It's part of the, the, the DNA in there. Um, and it's really needed by all living organisms on earth. Um, so that diagram I put in there to the right, um, I don't be scared off by it. I'm not gonna get into the chemistry, but this is just to illustrate that there is such a thing as a nitrogen cycle, meaning you know nitrogen uh, cycles in the environment, it goes up in the atmosphere, it changes its composition, it's used by animals, um, and this is a, a natural, cyclical, healthy process. The issue comes when the balance of nitrogen is off, right? There's more nitrogen where there shouldn't be. Um, and that's when we have what's known as nitrogen pollution. So how does nitrogen pollution happen? Well, unfortunately, because of the way that our infrastructure works and our society functions, there are a lot of different sources of nitrogen um, that make their way to our local waterways. So in Long Island, the number one source of nitrogen pollution is human waste. And we see it in two main ways. So one is through wastewater treatment plants. So we actually um, excrete nitrogen in our urine. Um, and wastewater treatment plants do a, a great job at removing bacteria and other pollutants but maybe not necessarily nutrients, historically speaking. So um, in some cases, wastewater treatment plants are big sources of nitrogen. And another way in which human waste is a source of nitrogen is that, as you may know, um, most of our homes here on Long Island are not sewered. Um, they tend to be on cesspools or septic systems. And similarly, septic systems don't, you know, may or may not have uh, may, may or may not be built to remove nitrogen, right? Or they may be leaky and old and um, some of that nitrogen can make its way into the groundwater. Other ways in which we uh, end up with nitrogen in the water are through atmospheric deposition. So believe it or not, just um, you know, the car exhausts goes into the atmosphere and uh, makes its way into the water as well. Um, the second greatest source of uh, nitrogen in Long Island, though, is fertilizer. So as we know, summer comes, everyone loves their um, lawns nice and, and green. And unfortunately, um, depending on the fertilizing practice, uh, a lot of that fertilizer can sometimes end up in waterways. So, um, you know, again, uh, it rains. And you being in a watershed means that that excess fertilizer is caught by that rain. It makes its way down uh, through storm drains and makes its way to the water. And so all of these things contribute to nitrogen pollution. So what is the issue is um, that nitrogen pollution can have a lot of negative environmental ramifications. So one of these is uh, har harmful algal blooms or algal blooms. 
Um, I mentioned that nitrogen is um, often a big component of fertilizer. So imagine, you know, you're essentially fertilizing the water. So what's going to happen is you're going to have an excess amount of algae, right? And that's how you get these blooms. And apart from, you know, the beach closures and the disruption to fisheries that these algal blooms cause, what also happens is that once you have this excess amount of algae in the water, once they die and begin decomposing, the bacteria that um, work in this decomposition process actually use up the oxygen in the water. And that causes what's known as hypoxia, which is low dissolved oxygen in the water. So as we know, you know, uh, organisms need oxygen to breathe, right? And so unfortunately, this is when you start seeing things like fish gills and things like that. So the final, um, uh, the final impact of nitrogen pollution that I'll mention is habitat degradation. So I'm giving the example here of two habitats we have here. Um, we have salt marshes and we have what's known as submerged aquatic vegetation, which is that on the right. And both of these habitats are really important uh, for wildlife. They serve as nurseries and um, they help protect young from, from predation. But they're also really important for us and for our communities because they help protect um, coast, the coast from storm surge and from erosion. Um, so what is being done by um, resource managers and agencies about this? Well, we're, we're doing it, we're um, going at it from different uh, avenues, right? So for many years, we've been working on um, updating, upgrading, excuse me, the wastewater treatment plants. And a lot of upgrades have happened in New York, thankfully. Um, there's a lot of um, septic system upgrade incentive programs happening right now that are available to the public to encourage people switching um, their septic tanks and upgrading them. Um, we work a lot on investments on green infrastructure. So things like um, of, you know, to avoid stormwater runoff, to um, imp implement um, pervious um, ground cover and things like this. And of course, we work a lot on uh, habitat restoration. Now, I'll end with this. As you've seen, a lot of these issues, though, require more widespread community changes. There's a lot of lawns out there. There's a lot of septic systems. So that's why uh, we are so happy to have you join us here today to talk about how we can all uh, continue progress together as a community. So thank you. With that, I will uh, pass it over to you, Sarah. Uh, yes, <laughs> I thought you meant Sarah Healy. So um, thank you so much, Jimena. Um, next we'll have uh, Sarah Healy, Present, and she'll be talking about Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan initiatives and smart fertilizer practices. So go ahead, Sarah Healy. Hi, everyone. Nice to be with you all tonight. Um, as Sarah just said, my name is Sarah Healy. I work with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation on the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan. And during my section of the webinar, I'll be talking with you about actions you can take on your lawn, specifically regarding fertilizer to help improve water quality on Long Island. Next slide, please. So before going into these specific tips, um, I just wanted to provide a little background on LINAP itself. Um, Jimena gave a great overview, and I'm sure as homeowners on Long Island, you've experienced some of the things she's talked about firsthand, whether that be fish kills, beach closures, or um, those, seeing those harmful algal blooms in our water. So clearly nitrogen and nitrogen pollution is a big problem here on the island. And because of that, in 2015, the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan was created to help address this problem. We're a very unique state program in that we are created to leverage and coordinate work that is being done to, to for a cohesive reduction in nitrogen and um, improvement in water quality. So LINAP works in both Nassau and Suffolk County. So our initiatives take an island-wide approach and we have many partners on the federal, state, and local level to help collaborate and facilitate on nitrogen reduction projects. Next slide, please. So today I will be using statistics from a 2021 Long Island Sound homeowner study to help highlight and discuss smart fertilizer practices. So starting off with the first one, 
34% of Long Island residents fertilize themselves, meaning they don't use a landscaping service. So try to use these, if this is you, try to use these tips on your lawn to fertilize more responsibly. But remember, it's best to not use fertilizer at all. So tip number one, if you don't fertilize and you're happy with what you're doing and you're happy with how your lawn looks, keep doing what you're doing. Now, if you do fertilize, here's the tips for you. Um, after you mow, try leaving your grass clippings on your lawn. Grass clippings are 80% water and contain two to 4% nitrogen, phosphorus, and other good nutrients. So removing the grass clippings after you mow actually removes fertilizer or like that nitrogen that your grass needs. Um, not only is this an environmental benefit, but it could also be a cost saving practice for you homeowners as it would lower the amount of times you're applying fertilizer and thus how much and how often you need to buy product. Tip number three, um, sweep up excess fertilizer to reduce runoff. So fertilizer that falls onto sidewalks, driveways, or other impervious surfaces will end up being carried away with the next rainfall, eventually ending up in our rivers, lakes, embayments, and even groundwater. And the photos that you're seeing on this screen actually come from a fellow DEC coworker who's working on transforming his yard to be more eco-friendly and habitable for wildlife. Um, in the pictures, you can see longer grass, native plants, as well as a sign that reads, pardon the weeds, I'm feeding the bees. So just an example of what a more wild or natural yard could look like. And there's actually um, an interview with this person in the resource packet that will be going out so you can read about um, his journey to making his lawn more eco-friendly. Next slide, please. Um, continuing on with the, the same statistic, um, just like sweeping up excess fertilizer is important, it's also important to keep fertilizer, grass clippings, and leaves out of storm drains, as most storm drains lead directly to our surface waters, which are those lakes and rivers and embayments. Um, and so with leaves and grass clippings falling into the storm drain, it will be transporting all the nitrogen and nutrients with it. I didn't know that about storm drains before I started working on um, line app, I think it's pretty common that we don't really think about where our storm drains end up, but they do mostly end up at surface water bodies. So um, the next tip, this is my personal favorite tip. Another practice you can try is redirecting your downspout into plant beds, a rain barrel, or directly onto your lawn. This will not only help reduce excess nitrogen, sorry, help, run, help reduce runoff of excess nitrogen, but also help with water conservation by letting the rain water your yard or plants for you. And I'd also just like to say, if you aren't part of the 34% who fertilize themselves and you do use a landscaping service, try to take these tips to your landscaper and advocate for yourself. Um, maybe ask them to keep grass clippings on the lawn if they don't already do that. Ask them to make sure they're sweeping up any excess fertilizer. Or if you live near a storm drain, maybe alert them to the fact that um, grass and leaves in the storm drain isn't good and you want them to make sure that that area is nice and clean when they leave. So just wanna emphasize these tips are not just for people who fertilize themselves. If you use a landscaping service, you should definitely try to advocate um, for your service providers to use these tips if possible. Next slide, please. So moving on, 60% uh, of Long Island residents fertilize two times or more a year. Lineup, rec sorry, Lineup recommends that application should only occur between April and October. And the rationale for this comes from the fact that grass can only absorb fertilizer when it's actually growing. And grass plants stop growing and become dormant when soil temperature is below 55 degrees Fahrenheit or in the heat of the summer above 85 degrees. These application dates are also consistent with Suffolk County's law and Nassau County's similar regulation. An easy way to remember is to make sure you're done fertilizing by Halloween. As you can see in the graphic on the slide, um, in 2019, even by May 6th on Long Island, the soil temperature wasn't even at that 55 degrees mark. So make sure you're paying attention to soil temperature and the weather before applying. 
Another tip is to utilize slow release fertilizer when possible. Uh, quick release or typical fertilizers uh, mean nitrogen is immediately available to the plants, whereas with slow release fertilizers, just like its name, nitrogen is released over time, allowing for plants to absorb nitrogen at a rate that they actually can. So when a plant can't use all that nitrogen, that's the excess that can run off or leach into the groundwater that we've been talking about and leading to that water quality degradation. On average, slow release fertilizers can release nutrients for six to eight weeks. So by switching to slow release fertilizers and adhering, adhering to your county's laws, you can see where fertilizing two times per year might not be necessary for year long. Next slide, please. Now, I just wanna go a little bit more into slow release fertilizers as again, this was not something I've heard of before working on LineApp. So just like I mentioned, it releases a small steady amount of nitrogen over time, actually allowing for the plant to uptake nutrients as needed, reducing the risk of runoff and leaching. And again, not only is this an environmental benefit, but for homeowners, it's a cost saving practice as again, you're reducing the amount of times you're applying, thus reducing the amount of product you need to buy. Next slide, please. So you have your slow release fertilizer bag. Now what? Slow release fertilizer bags will have directions and spreader settings just like conventional bags. Follow the spreading directions on the bag to help reduce over application. Even over applying with slow release fertilizer is, could still lead to excess nitrogen and pollution. So make sure you're following those directions carefully. And in addition, if you haven't lately, try calibrating your spreader equipment for more accurate application. This should be done annually. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, folks, technical difficulties. There we go. Okay. Next slide, please. Sorry about that. Internet. <laughs> no worries. Okay. All right. So I just want to talk about a line app initiative that really ties together these eco friendly tips that I just touched on, as well as the others that you'll be hearing from our other speakers. And this is the Long Island Gardens Garden Rewards Program. Um, this program was launched this year and is a homeowner's reward program with reimbursements up to $500 for eligible practices such as installing a rain garden, rain barrel, or native planting on your property. So to circle back to that tip on redirecting your downspout, you could purchase a rain barrel, redirect your downspout into it, reduce fertilizer runoff, improve your water conservation, and then apply to our program for reimbursement for that rain barrel. So it's a really great incentive program. Um, and if you missed the window this year, don't worry, the program will be running next year as well. Um, you can follow the QR code on this slide that will take you to the program webpage and learn more about the program and what is or is not eligible for reimbursement. Um, also a link to this program will be in the resource packet that goes out. So don't worry, um, this won't be the only time you see this information. And next slide. So that's it for me. Thank you all for listening. And I'd be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A session. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, that was fantastic. And uh, I believe we do have some questions for you in the chat, but we'll hold off for right now. We're gonna have um, Paul Granger and Michael White from YCAP present on NASA and Suffolk County water conservation measures. So uh, take it away. I don't know who's speaking. It, 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 it will be uh, Paul Granger and, and good evening. Unfortunately, Michael White uh, could not make it tonight. So he sends his regrets and regards, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I work very closely uh, with the other board members on LICAP. So I will certainly cover his material in great uh, detail. 
So my, my name is Paul Granger. I am the superintendent for the Hicksville Water District, but I'm also a board member on the Long Island Commission for Aquifer Protection. Basically, the uh, commission was uh, created because the aquifer doesn't know any political boundaries. Uh, so it was a great approach. Uh, we were created back in 2013, which this year is our 10th anniversary, uh, <clears throat> to kind of regionalize our approach to drinking water uh, quality protection and water conservation. And that's what I'm going to focus in on. But I do appreciate having the opportunity to participate because uh, water is interrelated to quality, quantity. And, you know, we represent the drinking water side, but uh, it, it, it is critical uh, to protecting, you know, our estuaries and obviously our sole source aquifer. Uh, so basically, uh, light cap, next slide, I'm sorry. <clears throat> That's it. Uh, since we're a regional scale, so uh, water providers are representative. Uh, we have representatives from the Nassau and Suffolk County Executive's Office, Legislature and Health Departments. Uh, Nassau County, uh, Suffolk and Soil Water Conservation Districts are also uh, on the board, along with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the United States uh, Geological Survey. So we, we have a, a good makeup of the board and, uh, you know, we were able to bring uh, science and the facts and fund initiatives to uh, help address water quality and quantity uh, concerns. Matter of fact, when we were created, the re when we reauthorized in 2018, it resulted in a uh, uh, creation of the Water Conservation Subcommittee. Uh, next slide, please. So why is water conservation important? Seems very intuitive. So I'm gonna touch base in several areas. So, you know, Long Island, we're, we're lucky in a way that Long Island uh, has a sufficient supply of water, but it's not limitless. limitless. Um, there's certainly, uh, we're designated as a sole source aquifer. So we can't get our water from anywhere else unless you do desalination, which we obviously do not want to do. Uh, we do have nine, approximately seven to nine trillion gallons of water underneath our feet, but it doesn't mean that uh, we need to, um, you know, use this water needlessly. There's many reasons why we have to conserve. Obviously, we want to be proactive. You don't want to wait for a crisis or an emergency. Uh, you really want to have good habits uh, and promote uh, awareness, you know, and promote our programs that are in place. So a little bit uh, with, with water conservation, as you may be aware, uh, water suppliers are investing hundreds of millions of dollars, in improving our infrastructure, uh, addressing water quality concerns, improving water quality treatment. Uh, so obviously, the higher the water usage, the more infrastructure and the more costs that's passed along to the customers. Peak water usage uh, for us occurs between 3 and 7 a.m. And it certainly impacts water pressure and, and fire protection. And obviously, over pumpage can have very negative quality uh, impacts on, uh, on our drinking water supply. And DEC, more importantly, has uh, set a goal for us to reduce our peak pumpage uh, by, by 15%. So the other things that we have to think of with regard to water conservation, I, you know, we all, I think if you talk to anybody, everybody has a vested interest in the environment and want the environment, but at the end of the day, it comes down to saving money. So obviously we promote the environmental benefits, uh, but there's also great economic benefits with regard to water conservation because people tend to overwater, which we'll talk about in a second. What's also important as we address climate change concerns is that we will reduce our carbon footprint the less water we use. So for example, in my district in Hicksville, uh, we spend close to $1.5 million a year uh, in uh, electrical energy costs, which is crazy because we have to pump the water out of our aquifer. So it's very energy intensive. Uh, we use chemicals to adjust the pH to, and to disinfect the water. And more importantly, we've been investing along with uh, all of our water suppliers in Nassau and Suffolk County, a lot in infra infrastructure and providing filtration. So we use tons and tons of granular activated carbon. So the less water you pump, less uh, impact on the carbon uh, uh, footprint. Next slide, please. Quick overview. Nationally, uh, we use 9 billion gallons of water each day. But the sad part is it's used for mainly landscape irrigation, which is wasted, it's not used effectively. That's why I really like this venue we have today because we can talk about effective measures for using our uh, most vital natural resource. Uh, it's been estimated, whether you talk to folks at EPA or other experts that 50% of this water is wasted 
because of overwatering inefficiencies. You know, how many times do you uh, drive and see uh, people watering their driveway, sidewalks, and streets? That uh, drives me nuts as a water supplier. But there are technologies out there that can control the overwatering and be very strategic with applying water when plants really need it. Next slide, please. So as we talked about, uh, so on Long Island, let's put it in perspective and bring it home, about 70% of all our water pumped uh, by water systems is used for outdoor purposes, okay? The Suffolk County Water Authority, my colleague to the east, and we work very closely with, uh, they nearly turn, they turn off nearly three quarters of their wells in the winter uh, and with other systems merely taking similar measures. In other words, we don't need as many facilities in the water, uh, in the winter uh, for that. Uh, and obviously, as we talked about, uh, increased demand means uh, more infrastructure to be built and to be maintained. An average well without treatment costs about a million dollars to install. Add on treatment and all the other bells and wind, wind whistles, you can spend five, five to 10 plus million dollars for a new source. Next slide, please. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is the graph I kind of wanted to show everybody here that compares the cool weather pumpage, almost comports to uh, when you should not apply your fertilizer October to April, and your warm weather pumpage uh, May through September. And you can clearly see in this graph, the uh, blue represents the cool water pumpage or the winter pumpage as we might call it. And the uh, red or orange, depending on how it shows up on your screen is the warm weather pumpage. And depending upon systems, you can double, triple or quadruple your pumpage uh, uh, in the warm weather. It, it is really uh, crazy, it keeps me awake at night and I do appreciate the, the thunderstorm that rolled through that will help us uh, mitigate the irrigation need. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay, this is a good slide here. I think click once, click again, click again. I just wanna show all the graphs and one more click. There we go, perfect. So this represents, this is from the Suffolk County Water Authority and they do a very nice job of keeping track of, of pumpage and water use and they're very proactive with water conservation and monitoring uh, quantity and quality. And you can see here, this represents uh, the, the hourly water usage on, the, on a peak day or a peak summer day. And you could see, which is remarkable, when all the irrigation systems come online, the stress it puts on the system, the stress it puts on the aquifer, you increase your pumpage 20 fold which is just remarkable. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we doing about it? Well, we're certainly not sitting back. Uh, you know, water suppliers really need to, to be diligent than they are. So uh, through LICAP uh, and with the assistance of the Suffolk County Water Authority, it's, it's really uh, helped lead us, uh, our organization, uh, with uh, the water qual quality and quantity initiatives. Uh, we came together and developed uh, Our Water, Our Lives uh, to develop uh, single uh, messaging, sim single simple uniform messaging across Long Island. Because I said, as I said before, um, water does not know political boundaries when it comes to our sole source aquifer. So, education is really the key here in terms of getting out to the uh, to the public. Uh, and and, that, that, and what's interesting with that um, is why education is important. Is you're noticing the change in population as people get older, they're moving out of the region. We're having people move in from the city and from other regions onto Long Island. And they, they live in New York City and they might not be aware of our uh, of, of water conservation guidelines and things of that nature. So this is very important to get the messaging out when we use many different uh, platforms. Uh, next slide, please. So it was founded by residents, uh, government officials, water suppliers, and environmental organizations. It really brought a whole teamwork approach uh, to uh, to water conservation. Uh, and that's what, why, you know, when we get the opportunity to address the patients, um, we really want to stress that we can't do it alone as water suppliers. So we work with irrigation contractors, landscaping professionals, a lot of good people out there, our customers, obviously. The environmental and community groups uh, that are, are part of this uh, webinar, and obviously our elected officials and regulators. Uh, DEC has been um, great to work with in terms of uh, staying diligent with uh, uh, reviewing our annual uh, water conservation reports and kind of sharing ideas. And, and they are members of LICAP, like I said, so it is a team, true teamwork approach. Uh, next slide, please. 
So our initial campaign was founded in, in 2019, and uh, you know we're 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 continuing to sustain this program, and this is a good opportunity for us to promote it, and have folks who are on this uh, webinar to perhaps go to the website, take the pledge, and and review our materials. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, and that basically illustrates the campaign that we initiated in 2019, and it's still ongoing. Uh, the campaign was launched uh, in uh, in 2019 with a $100,000 ad campaign because the key part was to get out both on multiple platforms to educate our public. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we had press conferences. We worked with county legislatures, uh, legislators. Uh, we announced back in July of 2019 uh, Smart Lawn Watering Awareness Month. Next slide, please. And you can see uh, the, the executive buildings in each county were uh, uh, blue to recognize Smart uh, Watering Awareness Month. Okay. So uh, next uh, slide, please. So we're gonna get into the heart of what's out there, Long Island Water Conservation Rules and Regulations. So with LICAP uh, and with uh, uh, various uh, uh, development going on and things of that nature, the Long Island Water Conservation Rules are no longer a Nassau or Suffolk thing. It is a regional approach which we appreciate. Uh, we have embraced uh, Nassau and Suffolk County suppliers have embraced odd even lawn watering measures, which we'll talk about. Um, we've also um, implemented other, other measures with regard to shaving the peak, but also to promote water conservation as both an environmental and economic benefit. Because like I said, end of the day, most people, they love the environment, but when it comes to economics, uh, they, they get that too. Next slide, please. So uh, with regards to the Nassau County rules and regulations, their, their first rules were adopted in 1987 with the odd even warning, you know, basically, and it also prohibits the uh, irrigation during the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. and addressed other areas to, to save water, such as air conditioning systems, uh, water recycling for car washes and hydrant usage and things like that. So the odd even, uh, which basically if you live in a uh, even number house, you could water on an even day, on an odd day, uh, you would, uh, or, or, you know, water on an odd, uh, uh, the odd address would water at that time. So that helps with shaving the peak, but that's one tool in the toolbox. You saw that one graphic I showed you from the Water Authority that shows you the dramatic increase and in stress it puts on our systems and on the aquifer with, uh, with over pumpage. So uh, Nassau County in 2016 uh, modified the ordinance to require automatic irrigation systems to use technology. Uh, to mitigate uh, the use of water, which would interrupt, you know, if you have sufficient moisture, you would interrupt the use of uh, the irrigation system, the automatic irrigation systems. Uh, next slide, please. So Suffolk, um, and, and talk, we'll talk a little bit about Suffolk County Water Authority. They, they have implemented some very uh, progressive and aggressive programs that uh, educate the customers. They have a tier rate plan, which most suppliers have. Uh, they've enhanced their leak detection. They've created uh, a WaterWise checkup, a WaterWise account credits, water talk programs. And I, you know, I, and being a water geek, I've, I've seen these programs. They, they are great. And they've adopted in promoting the odd even program uh, for watering. Next slide, please. Okay. So once again, uh, I'm, I'm wrapping up. I want to stick to the uh, time slot and the, the last minute I have here is that the water supplies across Long Island are, are really uh, taking these efforts because as the rules and regulations for water quality get more aggressive, as we investing in, in infrastructure, it, it really ignores everybody's benefit to, to use the water wisely, use the tools in the toolbox. So for example, Suffolk County Water Authority is offering rebates, uh, various uh, smart controllers, other water savings devices, my district, as many other districts, uh, they're also ordering, we're also offering rebates on smart controllers. So wherever you live, reach out to your water supplier and see what programs they have. So if you're in Suffolk County, go to the Suffolk County website, which uh, I believe at the end, they'll have some information there. We'll have our water, our lives uh, information for you to, to view. Uh, and, you know, in the brief time we have, you know, I, hopefully I touched upon the importance of uh, odd even irrigation, using technology, and being mindful of the weather uh, when you irrigate. So we'll answer some questions later and uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. 
Um, and the next presentation we'll have is from Roxanne Zimmer from Suffolk Cornell Cooperative Extension. So once Jimena pulls up the slides. I've got it. It's my pleasure to be here on choosing native plants in the context of reimagining Long Island lawns. This is a handout that you will receive in your packet in which I go through the plants that I identify when I talk about considering integrating native plants in your gardens. So I love to begin with this first question. What is the most planted and irrigated crop in America? And I'll give you a hint, it's a four letter word. Well, most people would say, of course it's corn, but it's lawn or turf. There are about three times as much area in the United States irrigated as lawn than corn. And you know, we have a lot of corn here. Turf is in fact the most irrigated crop in our country. And where are those lawns? Well, NASA did this research and Long Island clearly is front and center. We have a lot of those lawns. For many years, we were sold a bill of goods that this was an aesthetic that we all might or should achieve. What do we know now? My goodness, this is harmful for the environment. This is not a biodiverse place. Lawns, in fact, can be harmful for the ecosystem because of all of those inputs that we are hearing, we heard from Jimena and in another sense from Paul. And that is, we're ultimately taking care of this lawn with fertilizers we probably don't need, with other herbicides that are, are harmful to us and to everyone else on the planet. We engage in a lot of mowing and blowing that also eats up a lot of carbon resources. And then as Paul was just discussing, we are watering our lawns perhaps 50% more than we need to. And think about it, that's fresh water and we're not eating our grass and that water is just going away. So we're doing a lot in service of the lawn, which is a monoculture. So what I'd like us to do is rethink the lawn by adding borders and beds to reduce the amount of area in the service of lawn or turf by incorporating native plants. And if you think about it, the image on the left really is on life support, whereas the image on the right has much more that makes it uh, a better ecosystem. Here is a lawn that has been lost. What a beautiful uh, front area. Again, there is still some lawn, but a nice border and uh, along the uh, sidewalk and the path. And reduced lawn here with shrubs to the side. So about introducing native plants, I just wanna remind folks that those are the plants that are most adapted to where we live. They are, um, uh, they know what amount of rainfall typically falls each year in our area. They understand our heat. Why should we be considering incorporating more native plants? Well, the first reason is natives are particularly hardworking. Look at that Kentucky bluegrass kind of circled in the red in the center. Not too many roots there, yes, and we know it loves to drink water. Now it's true that there are good root systems on the hydrangea and the daylilies on the left, but check out the root systems of the natives on the right. Oh my goodness, right? Um, a couple of ornamental grasses, uh, as well as a uh, rebecca. That native root system is really hardworking as a natural filter, taking up excess nitrogen and phosphorus. It's also doing a wonderful job retaining the soil, whether from water or wind. And at the same time, that wonderful root system makes it difficult for weeds to find their way into the soil. Not only are natives hardworking, but they're relatively easy to maintain. 
They require less, if any, water once established, and they're very adapted to the local climate. Now, I see that I took this photo this weekend, uh, and there, it's because these natives were so attractive. That's the butterfly weed and the black eyed Susan. And I was just thrilled to see that the woman who planted these in her yard is in the is in the uh, group tonight. So shout out to Deb. Thanks for your beautiful native plants that I used in this slideshow. And another reason natives are terrific is that they provide food and shelter for our wildlife. Natives are about four times as likely to attract pollinators as cultivars of that species. Now, I've just introduced a word that we need to say something about. And I'd like to distinguish native plants from cultivars, nativars, and exotic invasives. So I have a native plant that many of you probably know. It's one of my favorites, purple coneflower. Uh, you see, many of our wildlife in our wildlife are attracted to it. And I just love when the goldfinch sits on it in my yard and picks at the, uh, the, the head. Well, this Achinacea has been a wonderful plant that we got from the prairie United States. But so many of the hybridizers have said, let's use that native and make cultivars. So you see now all of these plants with the first name Achinacea and then in quotes, some cultivated variety next to it. What I'd like to remind everyone in this audience is that the cultivars are not the native species. They're not their wild ancestors, as lovely and as pretty as they are. So that cultivars started out with the species, but they were developed by some human intervention into something that's not naturally occurring, this cultivated variety or cultivar. Yes, they were bred because of the aesthetics. It's taller, bluer, pinker, fuller. It may have disease resistance, but it's not gonna be as hardworking as its native parent. There's another word that's taking off in the plant world, and that's native Rs. And that's a really confusing term because you see the N-A-T-I-V there and you think it's a native plant. No, this is again, the image of all kinds of wonderful native Rs of our Achinacea. But the native Rs are nothing more than a cultivar of the wild species. So my suggestion is, if you like these plants, they're terrific to plant fine, but note that they are not natives, even though they bear something of that Achinacea name. This is the native purple coneflower that uh, should be in all of our gardens. And then a word or two about in exotic invasives. These are plants from elsewhere with very aggressive characteristics. And inevitably they're gonna cause harm to our environment because they outcompete our natives. They kind of displace the water and the land use. And also our uh, native um, wildlife doesn't know what to do with them. And here are just a few of these invasives that when we're thinking about reimagining the lawn, if we have these two in our yards that they might uh, take a hike. Uh, up the upper left, that's the Euonymus burning bush golden bamboo, Japanese barberry in the center on top. In the spring, many of you probably saw some of the lesser celadine. In bloom now is the loosestrife, and then of course the English ivy. So these are exotic plants that really will overtake a habitat and are not helpful to our native friends. Roxanne, just a reminder, you have one minute. Oh my goodness. So um, uh, looking at all of these then, I picked flowers that uh, are good for their habitat or their foliage. Most like dry soil, uh, many are deer resistant, uh, but as you know, that's a term that we just need to discuss later. Okay, golden alexanders are a great first choice. All of these are in the resource that I share with you. Wild indigo or baptisia, a beautiful source early spring. Threadleaf blue star is great for its structure and its foliage. 
Lance leaf tick seed. Cinnamon ferns are wonderful as are the lady ferns. Bee balm, wonderful for your garden. Tropical milkweed is something you should avoid, but consider the common milkweed if aggressive. Swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, St. John's wort, wonderful for its flower and structure. Black-eyed Susans, anise hyssop, Joe pieweed, sweet goldenrod, and New England aster. All of these you can find with, and many more in the National Wildlife Federation collection. Enter by zip code. Also absolutely terrific that will be in the resources for you, the Pollinator Partnership, which is a terrific collection of plant descriptions, uh, the Floral Atlas of New York, and the Xerxes Society for the Mid-Atlantic, and some of my resources to help you imagine a different lawn by choosing native plants. All right. Thank you so much, Roxanne. That was uh, a wonderful ending. I love how you wrapped it up um, with all those examples. And we will now have uh, Raju Rahan, who is with Rewild Long Island, talk about uh, sustainable landscaping in action. So take it away. You're muted, Raju. All right, you can hear me. Thanks a lot, everybody, for hanging in there. Um, I won't take long. What I will do is I'll give you some examples of actual sustainable gardens. And, and, and the example I like to use is to say, look, you know, your conventional landscaping with a lawn and your azalea and the rose bush and the hydrangea, I mean, they're common, they are everywhere. That's like eating at eating fast food, right? I mean, it's convenient, it's easy. But then the variety is limited. You're, you're, you're pretty much limited to what is on the menu of most landscapers, and that's a limited set of things. Whereas sustainable landscaping is like cooking at home, right? It's Yes, it requires more skill and that you understand the ingredients, but ultimately it has enormous health benefits. It has enormous variety. The, the quality, the the the, the, the purposes and the joy you get from it are completely different. Now, if I think about sustainable landscaping as cooking at home, what are the key ingredients that go into this, right? We like to use the acronym CROWN, right? So this, all of these are things that you heard about over the course of this presentation. But that CROWN is basically composting. Composting is at the heart of making soil. Your kitchen waste, all the yard waste you throw away, the leaves that fall from your trees, everything can go back to making compost. We like to start with compost because everything begins with the soil and the life that lives in the soil, right? So compost. The second thing about sustainable landscaping is you buy less, right? Whether it's bags of fertilizer, bags of mulch, bags of compost, um, or annual plants that come in their own plastic pots that you then throw away. It's, it's just reduce, reuse, recycle. So just lowering your footprint by consuming less from that never-ending marketplace of uh, whether it's the latest cultivar or the latest uh, annual that is out there. Third is organic uh, gardening. A lot of people didn't talk about growing food, but I think it's so important for our children and for ourselves to have that tomato plant or that basil or that herb garden in your backyard. Things that kids know and, and adults know that, hey, it's growing in my yard. I know it is safe. It actually can't, you know, if it grows from your own compost, even, even better, right? And, and there you have completed this food cycle of growing something in your yard. Um, from something that you generated that would have otherwise been waste and would have gone to generating um, uh, 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 carbon emissions. Right? The fourth is watering wisely. We heard a lot about right lawns and native plants and how we can use rain barrels, rain gardens, a lot of those things. So the fourth ingredient is thinking about water. And the fifth ingredient is native plants, which uh, Roxanne was so brilliantly uh, talked to us about all the good things that come with native plants and the, all of these things interact right in in uh, and and let me show you an example this is the rewild garden at dodge sorry for that spin <laughs> but um here is what we have developed as a community garden space in port washington 
Uh, we have a compost yard. We have a number of families that bring, um, I see Paul Merkelson out there, so uh, responsible for a compost. A number of families bring their kitchen waste. We take all the yard waste from there. We take um, uh, you know, volunteer labor, turn that into fantastic rich compost, which then goes into our edible garden on the, on the vegetable beds on the right. And, and, and those vegetables usually are given away to our local food pantry. Um, uh, and, and the native garden beds that sit alongside uh, bring all the pollinators. So I never, I mean, every flower I see in a tomato plant that is next to a, a native plant gets pollinated because a bumblebee that comes all that way just goes and pollinates the tomato as well. And, and bee pollinated flowers and fruits are much richer, fuller of seeds. They, they, they just taste different, right? So um, putting your native plants next to your vegetable beds is a great idea for you to uh, 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 help yourself uh, and, and then putting the compost in and watering wisely and recycling, right? So bringing this together. So this is one example of what I would call a meal that comes from those five ingredients. And what we did on a sustainable landscaping tour, and these are popping up all over. So if you email myself or Roxanne or any one of us here, we will put you on list and tell you about a sustainable garden tour coming next to you. And that's a way for you to go and see these spaces that help three things, right? Food insecurity on one side, right? Yes, we have food pantries, but most of the things in food pantries are canned goods. They are, you know, your staples and, and they're not necessarily the best nourishment, especially for our young kids, a lot of whom are suffering from food insecurity. So whether we eat the guard food ourselves or donate it, that's fantastic. Climate change, right? Again, Roxanne told you about the deep roots of those plants and how they sequester carbon. Um, and, 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 and then you heard about about how lawns are uh, a source of carbon emissions. And most important, biodiversity, bringing in those pollinators, keeping those pollinators, and then helping the food web uh, above. Um, so one of the things that we have done, right, how can we use our yards creatively? Well, you can take those five crown ingredients, composting, uh, reducing organic uh, vegetables, uh, watering wisely, and native plants, and use it in very many different ways. For example, this is Anne-Marie Ansel in, in uh, Port Washington, who is one of our pioneers as far as sustainable landscaping is concerned. You see that little devil strip that is sitting right between your sidewalk and the road. She put flock subtilata on that, right? Um, and, and, and it stays evergreen. Cars can come, it, it, you know, you can walk over it, no problem. You don't need to mow it. And every one of us knows how hard it is to get water exactly on that strip because it goes all over. Here is a native perennial that can and uh, function for you. Likewise, there are a lot of little spaces all across your house, whether it's a little dingy area outside your shed in the back or under a tree where a lawn does not grow, where you can find the right native plant to fit in there. Here's another example. You talked about rain gardens. Look at how spectacularly beautiful this rain garden is. Um, this is one more rewilder, uh, Valerie in our uh, in, in Port Washington, who took the downspout from the roofs, um, channeled it into a rain garden and put a whole bunch of delightful, beautiful native plants that now don't require watering at all, right? They, they, they This not only soaks the water that comes off the roof into our aquifer, cleansing it, but it also is a spectacular landscape which now does not require mowing. Um, my own example in my backyard there on the left side, you see my parents sitting before my backyard lawn and that's what it looks like now. It's a meadow, right? So what we decided to do with our backyard lawn was to turn that into a full native plant meadow. And that's amazing. It's a, it's, 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 it's a changing panorama of different colors, of different insects, of pollinators, of right now. Today, I saw two monarch butterflies and a swallowtail butterfly and a goldfinch. I mean, so it's just amazing the, the kind of wildlife that visits and um, gives you joy throughout the seasons. Um, so we, we have done this in uh, many, very many different ways. And, and, and what I would say is that 
Uh, there are people who have done bird friendly yards. There are people who have done dog friendly yards. Uh, each one of these is a different combination of the same elements of how you use compost and build soil. How do you uh, reduce your footprint? How do you, uh, you know, uh, uh, plant or potentially include organic vegetables, water, and native plants? And if you did this um, at Rewild, what we see is it's a continuous experiment. We have uh, 11 sustainable gardens that we have sponsored across Long Island. And every one of these is an experimental test bed in how people can sort of cook at home, right? How people can combine these elements to make not only beauty, but also sustainability. And then create experiences for people where they can go in and view this and say, hey, this is something I can do at home and then take it, right? A picture, as I say, right? If, if a picture is worth a thousand words, going and seeing a garden is worth a thousand pictures, right? Then you get a good sense of the plant, how it fits. You can ask the host questions and then you can use that as an educational space that then people can, um, uh, uh, pe people can experience and learn from. So um, resources, we get a lot of questions. How do I start rewilding? How do I convert a lawn? What native plants will work for my yard? How do I design a native plant garden for my purpose? Is it a shade garden, a sun garden, a rain garden, food garden, an edible garden, right? You can do so many things. You can do a formal English garden with native plants, right? This It's only constrained by your imagination, right? There's nothing about the plants that say, oh, they need to all be together and make a meadow, right? You, you can take these plants and do what you will with it. And then other people can learn from you. And um, here, so we have a set of resources. If you go to our website, rewildlongisland.org resources, we have started building these resources. If you have more questions and send it over and we don't have an answer to that question, we'll put it right up there. Um, and when this package comes to you, you will get an additional set of resources um, together with it. So let me pause there and stop there because I wanna get us back on track and back on time. I know a lot of people have a lot of questions. So back to you, uh, Sarah and uh, Mina. All right. Thank you so much, Raju. Um, that was fantastic. I think you gave a lot of great examples of uh, these gardens in action. Um, and we do have a ton of questions. So in the remaining time we have, Elizabeth Hornstein is going to run through the questions we received and try to direct them to the panelists um, or just pose them to um, the panelists uh, and see who, who has a great answer. <laughs> so take it away. Thanks, Sarah. So um, starting uh, a couple questions for Sarah Healy to start us off, some easy ones. Is it good to leave grass clippings on the lawn even if you don't fertilize? Yes, so leaving the grass clippings on the lawn um, is, you could use it in lieu of fertilizing. As I mentioned, the grass itself contains nitrogen and water and those good growing nutrients. So you can use them in lieu of fertilizer. And um, if you still anticipate needing to use fertilizer, but you're starting to keep your grass clippings on the lawn, then you probably just need to adjust how much fertilizer you're applying. Um, since you are getting that additional input of nitrogen from the grass, you could probably use a significantly less amount of fertilizer from the bag. Okay, and another question, Sarah, for you, question for you, Sarah, while I have you here. Um, so one person said, how do I deal with the town code um, in the town of Southampton that requires me to keep my lawn cut? And can you also tell us, you know, what is the best height that we should ideally keep our lawn at? Yes, so the town code is definitely a barrier that I'd say people working in my field and in this industry encounter, um, kind of similar to like HOAs and their requirements for maintenance. Um, while I don't have a definitive answer for you today, it's definitely something that myself and everybody here on the panel works on, um, trying to get these codes either fixed or modified or look more in line with what uh, these eco-friendly yards that we're striving for should be. Um, so unfortunately, that's my answer for you today. And uh, I'll, I'll tap in Roxanne for this one. <laughs> 
between three and four inches should be the height that you leave your lawn at, nothing shorter than that. And the longer the, uh, the grass, the longer the roots underneath. So that's why you don't want to cut your lawn short because then the roots will be very short. Taller grass, longer root system. Correct. Thank you guys. Okay, and to kind of follow up on this topic, and I guess this could be for, for any of you, there were several questions in the chat about um, alternative lawn covers. So other solutions for walkable lawn replacements. Um, is changing the ground cover to clover or sedge more beneficial um, or any other alternatives that you guys have um, that might be better than lawn? Uh, clover is good. Thyme is good. Like people have had successful success with thyme. Um, as I said, creeping blocks in the right place um, seems to have worked. I mean, so those are three things that we I have seen people have success, proven success with. Um, sedges, your story. So go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just saying uh, some people use the uh, uh, low mow or no mow lawns, which right. is the right. cool season sedges. Um, I have seen mixed success with that, um, but but some people have succeeded. Yeah. More and some people and some people consider ornamental grasses rather than turf grass. Um, you know, they might, they might do an entire area of ornamental grass. It, traditionally, or before we started talking about natives, people would put ground covers down. And it really depends on what your soil and your moisture is um, to, to consider something like that, like epimedium um, uh, as, as one possible choice. Thank you, guys. Okay, I've got a couple questions um, for Paul, if he's here. Um, is there any evidence that groundwater flow has slowed down, which causes higher concentration of nitrogen? What's being done to help recharge the aquifer if all the water collected in sewers is released into the ocean? Well, uh, it, it's uh, tough to tell if, if the groundwater flow has slowed uh, at this point, but we will have that information from the USGS, I would say, by uh, the end of this year, next year, where they complete, they're completing their study and groundwater model. So I don't have any uh, definitive answers on that. Um, recharge uh, is always a concern. I believe with the uh, Grumman Navy plume remediation in Nassau County, that there will be elements of that because as they pump and treat water to address that plume, I believe that's being reinjected. Uh, Suffolk County is not fully uh, sewered. You have the Pine Barrens that uh, do act as a, a nice, very nice, uh, pristine recharge area. And Nassau County, many, many decades ago, did uh, experiment with the aquifer recharge. And I think that's going to be still on the table. And that might be a discussion once the uh, DEC USGS groundwater sustainability study is, uh, is issued, depending upon those results. So it, it was done many decades ago. It did work from a technology perspective, but it was... Um, not economically viable at the time. Uh, so it's in play. Thanks, Paul. And another question, sort of question, comment for you. Um, well, a couple of things, I guess, here. Um, there was a comment that those on the North Fork have not heard of the county water restrictions and that people have auto in-ground sprinklers that are going on in the rain, um, and those should be banned. And then another related comment that there seems to be no enforcement rewatering. So how are we, how is Suffolk County Water Authority and the other water districts, you know, addressing, we have these regular, these water rules in place, how are we enforcing them? Well, yeah, the enforcement is always a, a question that's asked. So let's talk about Nassau County. The regulations have been in, in effect for a much longer period in Nassau County and the uh, Nassau County Water Cons Conservation Ordinance does have an enforcement provision in which you can call the police and they will issue a $50 summons. But that doesn't really work that well because the police have more important jobs to do. And, and you know, I'm not minimizing water conservation, but it's very tough to get that type of enforcement. What we've been very successful with is the education. Uh, and that's important. Uh, so in my district and many other districts, we'll send out a warning with educational information and most people get it. Once you educate them, they'll make adjustments to the timers and things of that nature. Uh, Suffolk County, uh, right now, everything is, uh, is a voluntary and educational perspective. 
Uh, they've really ratcheted up their program and they've been reaching out to the town. So it's going to take time. Uh, I think eventually will there be need, need for enforcement? Perhaps. But we're finding the educational and outreach perspective uh, to be the best uh, approach. Now, what may happen in Suffolk is that the towns will take over enforcement. You could do to building code enforcement, uh, but that's going to be taken over time. And I know the Suffolk County Water Authority is engaging the towns and they're coming up with, uh, uh, they don't want to be draconian, but they want to be educational there and then maybe come up with strategies to deal with people who just don't get it. And unfortunately, there are some people out there. But right now, it's primarily education. And, you know, island wide, we've got to get the message out, the word out that, well, you know, we do have a, a, a very vital and, you know, verbaceous uh, water supply. It needs to be used very judiciously. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so there was a lot of uh, chatter about deer. So I want to take a moment just to address a couple of these things, but I want to preface this with None of us, I don't believe on this call, are managing the deer um, or our deer experts, but maybe um, we can find some contacts for you if people want to know more about that. Um, but there were some comments about on the east end, um, we can't plant these plants because the deer are eating everything. Um, but Roxanne, I believe some of the plants you mentioned, you know, are fairly deer resistant. So maybe um, we can just talk a little bit about some good deer resistant plants to give people some recommendations. So they were in the slideshow so that if you can look at the slideshow again, when the recordings, some of them are there, like they won't eat the Coreopsis. They tend not to eat the Monarda. They don't eat the Solidago. So as you take a look at, at those that you see, I would suggest to anyone here who's got a plant question, I see many about comments about the clover and other things. May I give you a phone number? Cornell Cooperative Extension has a home horticulture hotline that is open every weekday of the year between 9 a.m. and noon. If, though, if you're in the audience, the telephone number is 631-727-4126. Again, that's the Cornell Horticulture Hotline, 631-727-4126. 4126. And many of these questions that I've seen going back and forth in the chat, which I don't believe we'll all have the answers to, um, you can ask my colleagues, Alice and Sandra, the answers to those questions. You can also send them an email as well, but they answer the phone every weekday of the entire year, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Uh, until noon. Thanks again for putting that in the, uh, in the, in the box there. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, so, Roxanne. It's great right. information. And then I, I find that Rutgers, Rutgers University has a terrific source about um, deer resistant plants. Um, they have four different designations, if you will, most likely to be browsed, less likely to be browsed, rarely and seldom browsed. So the Rutgers University plant uh, deer list for plants I find very helpful and interactive. I'm sorry, Raj? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly point to a video I posted in chat. We had Dr. Jody uh, Gangloff Kaufman, I think, um, uh, present on how just the same topic, right? Ticks and mosquitoes, right? Most people don't spray because they want to kill bees or butterflies. I'm sure none of them are on this call. So <laughs> most people spray because they think they're protecting themselves from and their loved ones from ticks and mosquitoes. So try some alternatives first. So we have a video there, um, uh, everything from, you know, mosquito dunks to how to protect yourself more than um, trying to protect the entire yard, right? So um, just try that out, quick saying. Thank you, guys. Okay, so um, uh, continuing on the native plants, um, there was a question. Um, I live adjacent to wetlands in the town. What approach should be taken to reduce or replace invasive or non-native plantings along a shoreline that would not violate town or DEC rules? Um, it's a very important question, and you will need to get your town engaged in that, I'm pretty sure. Who here from the DEC can help me? Anyone here from? You usually have to engage someone who exactly needs a permit. 
I don't have any information off the top of my head just because I'm not a wetland person nor a permitting person. However, I can work to get the appropriate contact for this type of work and include that in the resource packet before it goes. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, and then there was also some questions about um, landscaping companies. So for people who don't want to do, don't have time to do their own lawns and garden themselves, um, people were wondering, is anyone working with landscaping companies and are there companies that we could point people to that are doing good sustainable landscaping? Um, we have some resources on our website, but again, I mean, this is something we need to encourage. If you know a young person that is getting, <laughs> looking at a career, I, this is really something we just desperately need. And if you know a young person who's in the business, please employ them. If they're coming out of Farmingdale with a degree in sustainability, please hire them, please pay them. Um, please make sure our young people stay here and do sustainable yards. Um, because yeah, that is a burning need for us, um, really. The, every day, that's my most asked question day after day, can you please recommend somebody to do this for me? And the same five people I send them are so booked. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, so I thought this was a pretty um, good question. So on the nitrogen front, um, so maybe Jimena or others, what is the prioritized set of practices that homeowners can take to reduce nitrogen pollution from most to least impactful? And how do we tell if we're making an impact if nitrogen is not being measured in our receiving body of water? Um, this person is on a team that samples water for um, bacteria, but they don't do nitrogen measurements. Um, so maybe we can provide some guidance on maybe who is monitoring nitrogen and what do we think are the most impactful actions that we could take? And Jimena, you or anybody else on the panel who wants to jump in, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I can start, but that's a big question. Um, so um, I, I'll start by saying that we do uh, we do monitor for nitrogen, um, at least in, well, I can speak mostly for the sound, um, but I imagine that other water bodies are also measuring. Um, there is a program called the Unified Water Study um, and um, they measure um, nitrogen among with other um, water quality parameters in different bays across uh, Long Island Sound. Um, and yeah, nitrogen levels as well as hypoxia, some of the some of the you know some of the impacts of nitrogen pollution, um, our programs constantly monitor for um, every year. Um, so, and, and actually, I guess I should have shared this in my presentation, but the good news is that we have seen um, improvements, significant improvements in um, the nitrogen uh, loads that make it into the water um, because of, you know, the work that has been put in by programs for many years now. So that is the good news. Um, so to answer the other piece of the question, um, in terms of impactful actions, they're really there's a lot of things that people can do. I feel like we covered a lot of them in this webinar. I, I don't, I don't know in order of uh, impact, but I think, I think a big, a big um, principle to understand is that, uh, you know, we have a lot of impermeable surfaces in our environment. You know, we have our driveways, we have our roads, and. Um, and you know, even our yards, if they're not made in the in the right way, um, can maybe not be the best um, in in um, retaining water and helping with that filtration process. So I think um, having that in mind when you are, you know, constructing your yard in your home, um, uh, you know, how can you reduce basically stormwater runoff? How can you reduce water from basically flowing over impermeable surfaces and grabbing onto everything it finds, oil and then nitrogen and fertilizer and all of that. Um, and so there's many ways to do that um, from costly to less costly. Um, uh, there's, you know, the, it can be things like installing rain gardens. It can be, um, you know, I, again, a lot of the 
um, tips that were shared in terms of what your garden looks like will help with that. Um, it can also be things like, you know, how you wash your car too, um, believe it or not. Um, so not washing it in the driveway, maybe washing it on your lawn instead, or even better taking it to a car wash because they have to dispose of water properly. Um, uh, yeah, the, that, that's, uh, there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, and what I'll do is I'll share um, in the chat, um, in our Long Island Sun City website, we have a page that says what you can do um, that gives you more ideas. So I'll share that. And then I'll, um, I'll throw it back to everyone else because I'm, I'm sure I missed plenty, but um, if anybody else wants to answer that. Okay, thanks, Jimena. We are we are getting short on time, and there was a question about the Garden Rewards Program and when the window closes this year. So, Sarah Healy, I wanted to make sure we got that question answered, if you can clarify. Yeah, totally. Um, there's no specific window. We're going until we run out of money. So there's still opportunity. Thank you. Okay, let me see if I can find one more question in here that would maybe be good for us to end on. Um, what, I guess for Rewild or anybody else, what resources are there for homeowners to help visualize planting design? Um, and is this going to be included maybe in some of those resources in our packet that we send out? Yeah, the visualization is like one of the most, um, it's the hardest thing because even if somebody draws it, it's just a moment in time, right? In any garden that you plant, especially a native garden that um, somebody designs for you, you'll have plants that are flowering in spring and some that come out in summer and they look different in fall. So a garden is a living, breathing thing. They look in the, they look one way in the first year and then they look a different way in the second year. And then you have different insects coming in. So it's, it's really, I mean, I'm just passionate about it because nature doesn't do it justice. You have to go and visit gardens and you have to visit them at different times of the year. And I think, um, uh, I think the, uh, Suffolk Alliance of Pollinators, Roxanne has a pollinator map. I mean, there's a, there are tons of gardens around you, right? So please go out and visit them um, and see how different plants do and imagine them in your house. And then, you know, of course, you can visit all our resources on the web and we have tons of photos and tons of advice, especially, right, uh, from people who have done it, who are writing blog articles based on their experience on Long Island definitely use those, right? So reach out to us, we'll help you. But again, it's your personal experience of those plants. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, nobody can substitute for. I'm sorry to be so enthusiastic and yet so unhelpful. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think that's, I think that's great and a good place. I know we didn't quite get to everybody's questions. I tried to get to as many as I could, um, but we are going to be sending out a resource packet that I think um, will help further address all of these questions that we have. Um, and we will be sending out the recording and the slides so you can review those. Um, you can contact us, you can contact um, the speakers that we had tonight for further information. I think they gave a lot of great information. So I just want to thank all of our speakers and panelists again for your time and your great presentations. And I want to thank um, all of the uh, audience here that joined us tonight for tuning in um, to learn more about sustainable landscaping. Hopefully you'll spread the word to your neighbors and others um, and we can start to reimagine uh, Long Island Longs. So thank you guys so much and have a good night. Good night, thank you. Thank you everyone. Have a good night.